You may be seated. Just before I preach this sermon, some of you have been concerned about my health, and I want to just give a, a brief report, uh, because I know you love me. I know that like I know my name. I know a couple of you out there love me. Uh, the last uh, few months, I've been experiencing some shortness of breath and I was very concerned about that I'm not an overweight person I'm not uh, a person who has not taken care of his body I was very concerned about that that I should be winded after the simplest of um, actions so I made an appointment with a cardiologist and I want to make sure there's no blockage in my heart and I was not carrying around a widow maker um, blockage. Um, so I went to a cardiologist and had a full cardio workup, a stress test, echocardiogram, and they found that, that in fact, the, the technician said, you have a beautiful heart. <laughs> uh, she said, I, have you b ever been a smoker? I said, no, ma'am. Drinker? No, ma'am. Um, she said, you have a beautiful heart. And I wrote in my journal, may it ever be. <laughs> may, I, may I always have a beautiful heart. But they said there were no, no problems with uh, my cardio system. I um, then said, well, why, why am I short of breath? I said, it, it could be the side effects of the medication you're on for rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, but I'm going to go to a pulmonologist next and see if they can find, is there anything in the lungs that might be making me short of breath. I have an appointment with a pulmonologist, but they could not see me until March, and that is not acceptable. <laughs> so I'm going to find another, try to find another pulmonologist um, and see if somebody can see me sooner. Um, I think if you're dealing with shortness of breath, you don't want to wait three months to find out why. <laughs> so I'd appreciate your prayers for me uh, as, um, as I deal with, with these issues. I had a conversation with my body recently, and I said to it, I've been good to you. <laughs> I've not filled you with drugs. I've not filled you with alcohol. And this is how you repay me? <laughs> By declining and breaking down? How dare you? My body did not answer, <laughs> except to make me short of breath. <laughs> but I would appreciate your prayers. Now let us pray. Holy God, speak, we pray now, through thy word, that we who hear it, read it, study it, may be changed thereby. We ask this in the strong name of our Lord Christ. Amen. One might see this psalm as an exposition of opposing pairs. This psalm is the first piece of biblical literature to present clearly a set of alternatives. An outstanding New Testament example of this would be the set of contrasts that Jesus presents in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 7, you know that passage. There we read about a wide gate and a narrow gate. A good tree bearing good fruit and a bad tree bearing bad fruit. A house built on a rock and a house built on sand. Here in Psalm 1, we have a similar kind of structure. And I've been enjoying revisiting Psalm 1 uh, in preparation for today. It's such a beautiful piece of literature. You have two delights, delighting in the Lord, or one can delight 
in the council and the paths and the seats of the ungodly. You have two growth models. You can grow as a sturdy, fruitful tree or grow in a shallow, chaff-like way. No substance. James Montgomery Boyce reminds us in his wonderful commentary on the Psalms that the wicked are like chaff in at least two ways. Chaff is worthless, and chaff is, in the end, burned. You have in this psalm two ends, standing at the end with the congregation of the righteous, or standing at the end as an ungodly person and perishing. King Solomon wrote in Proverbs 14:12. There is a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way of death. There is a way that seems right, but it only leads to death. So one may, must make choices between those alternatives offered. The late Norman Cousins, uh, who wrote for many years for the Saturday Review, uh, wrote a an autobiography, but it was not set up like an autobiography. It was written like a journal. He called it Human Options. And Norman Cousins said, the only thing that separates you and me from animals is that we can entertain options. Dogs and cats don't entertain options. They just do what dogs and cats do. But we can see a way of righteousness and a way of ungodliness, and we can actually decide which way to take. We can see a good tree bearing good fruit and a bad tree bearing bad fruit, and we can decide which tree we'd like to be. We can entertain alternatives and options. The promise of this psalm is that if you consider the ways offered and you choose the right way, you will prosper. There isn't anybody here who doesn't like to hear that. After all, we want to be prosperous, don't we? All of us. Look at verse 3 of this great psalm. That person shall be planted like a tree by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season. That person's leaf does not wither. And whatever that person does shall prosper. Now, before you think I am pushing a prosperity gospel, which I am not, I think prosperity preachers uh, will have a lot to explain at the end duping people into thinking if they just simply have faith, everything will turn out fine. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Jesus himself said, in this world, you, you're going to have trouble. Yeah, but I have faith. You're still going to have trouble. But I believe God. You're still going to have trouble. Yeah, but I'm a tither. You're still going to have trouble. I'm not preaching a prosperity gospel here. The, the Hebrew word for prosper means much more than having your material needs met. And in next week's sermon, I'm going to preach a sermon called Success Redefined. Because I think we have very shallow views of what success is. No, to to prosper in the Hebrew mind is not simply having your material needs met, food, clothing, shelter, and lots of it, no. In the Hebrew culture, Hebrew understanding, prosper means to thrive, to make steady progress, 
to push forward, to advance, all of that is in that Hebrew word for prosper. To be profitable. Beloved, I wish for you a very prosperous new year. But I don't limit myself to material gain, and I hope that happens for you. I want you to thrive, to truly live and advance in your walk with God. That's really what prosperity is. It isn't having more than one car, or trusting God to give you that private plane or that you know, second piece of property that you've always wanted. It isn't having designer clothes fill your closet, although that, that may be part of your understanding of prosperity, but it's prosper, to prosper in the Hebrew understanding is much more than that. It is to truly live, to thrive, to walk with Yahweh in such a way that it could be said, you are not dead, you are not a slacker, you are living, thriving, vibrantly in the presence of the God who made you. I wish for you a very prosperous new year. The intentionally prosperous person heeds the three negatives at the opening of this psalm. Listen to it again. I, some of you have memorized this psalm, but listen to three negatives. Blessed is the person who doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly who doesn't stand in the paths of sinners, who doesn't sit with the cynics. Did you hear it? I am so committed to thriving that I will see to it that I don't take my counsel from the ungodly. I'm so committed to thriving in the face of Yahweh that I will not stand in the path of sinners. I'm so committed to the prosperous, intentionally prosperous life that I will not sit in the seat of the cynics. This is, this is a choice. Humans can entertain options. I want you to be careful this year about who you hang with. Some people are simply not good for you. There are a lot of toxic relationships out there of which you don't need to be a part. In fact, some folks, I don't know who I'm talking to today, but some folks are going to have to be cut out of your life in order for you to prosper. You're going to have to say goodbye to some people. Some people are not good for you. And some of those people are even in your family. That's awkward. But you can't sit in the seat of the scornful. Sit with the cynics and expect to thrive. There are three negatives at the beginning of this psalm. And I dare you to take them seriously. And believe God to deliver you from those relationships that are only going to ruin you in 2023 rather than see to it that you thrive. I'm talking to somebody. I'm talking to somebody who's in a situation which is going to do you no good. A year lived apart from God is a shallow chaff-like year. Decide this year that you're going to prosper spiritually, that you're going to take your faith seriously, that you're going to walk with God and not sit in the seat of the scornful. What would it look like if I got serious about my faith? If I embraced the positive overarching theme of this Psalm, which is the person who walks with God will prosper. End of verse 3. There's a description of some men. I was reading this earlier this week in Judges chapter 9. It's just a little one-liner. But Abimelech 
hired some men. And it was said these men were described as vain and light persons, King James Version, or worthless and reckless men, New King James, or NIV calls them reckless scoundrels. Eugene Peterson in the message called them reckless riffraff soldiers. Judges chapter 9, verse 4. I don't want to be described like that. I don't want to be described as shallow, <clears throat> no substance, chaff-like. <clears throat> I heard about a woman who was, uh, what's a kind way to put this? An airhead. <laughs> and she would just, was described by someone who knew her as all vogue on the outside and all vague on the inside. <laughs> That's chaff. No substance. No heft. If you're not careful, you can start living like that. No grit. I, I don't want to go out like that. I wanted to say <clears throat> he was serious about God. Let's, let's dig in and take our God and our faith so seriously this year that we could only be described as sturdy, fruitful trees. I close with a citation from Psalm 92. The righteous, this is in 92, 12 to 14. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. Wow, don't you want that? The righteous will grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Listen to this language. This is not a shallow, chaff-like person. This is a person who is prospering. They shall, listen to this, bear fruit in their old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing. This would embarrass him, but I have, if, if I am still pastor here, when David Scott goes home to be with the Lord, I've thought about you when I've read this passage. This is the text I would lift up at your service, David Scott. They shall bear fruit in old age. What a, what a wonderful possibility that in your later years you could still be doing it. You could still be ministering. You could still be engaging people. You could still be talking to people about their faith. You could still be introducing Jesus to people. You could still be discipling people in your old age. That's a possibility according to Psalm 92. The righteous shall flourish. The righteous shall prosper. Even when they're old, they don't slack as they get older. They, they keep going for it. They, they want to go out strongly. Now that's prosperity. Let us pray. Holy God, we want so much to thrive, to live, to prosper. We mourn the days we have given ourselves to a very limited definition of prosperity. We mourn the time we have spent 
going after things which are material and ignoring that which is spiritual. And we pray that as we begin this new year, you would give to us a desire to prosper rightly, to walk with thee in such a way that people see you in us. Forgive us our shallowness. Fill us with a hunger for substance, we pray. I pray for those who must make very difficult decisions regarding relationships this year. For those who spent too much time in the path of sinners and in the seat of the scornful, who've taken too much counsel from the ungodly, and who have people in their lives who are dragging them down rather than building them up. As they make decisions as to how to respond to that, grant them, we pray, thy peace, thy wisdom, Lead them and guide them, we pray. We rebuke the adversary who would love to see them fail on every level in every way. We stand against Satan and his hosts in the strong name of Jesus. Now let your blood prevail. Let your blood cover us that we may operate and live in power and not in defeat. We ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus, Savior, Deliverer, Healer, and Coming King. Amen. Perhaps you're here today and you say, Pastor Farmer, I am not prosperous. I'm not prospering, but I want to. If you would have to say, I'm not in a relationship with God which sets me up to prosper. I'd like to speak with someone as to how I might have such a relationship. We have someone who would like to talk with you. Secondly, you may be here today and you say, Pastor Farmer, I am prospering, but I am without a church home and it's affecting my spiritual life. I feel led to explore uh, membership at Crossroads. This is a community of faith to which I am attracted and to which I seem to be being called. If that describes you, we'd also have someone who would love to talk with you. I'm going to ask Brother Terrence uh, Hayward to just come stand down here on the floor. As you respond to the Word of God as you've heard it today, and you feel compelled to have a conversation with Terence about your spiritual life, perhaps about your desire to connect with this body of believers. Just for the next few seconds, you think about that. And if you need to come, uh, Terence will take you off to a room and you'll chat. And that'll be the beginning of literally a new life and a new year. Father, in these moments of reflection, help those who need to respond to do so. That they may thrive is our prayer. That they may connect is our prayer. That they may get questions answered 
is our prayer. Would you come if you feel the need? Is God speaking to you? Is God tugging on your heart? Speaking to your mind? Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Terrence. I'm going to ask Brother Cleveland to come up and lead us.